Good morning. Um, welcome to worship on this fourth Sunday of Advent. Um, I realize this is not the way we all expected it was going to go, um, especially because at Christ Community we haven't had to cancel worship before. Um, and this is kind of a new scary thing. But we have to take the virus seriously, and since there was an exposure, this is the safest way for us to be. Um, a few announcements for us this morning. First, uh, you'll notice my background here. I figured since we were having to do it virtual, we could have a little bit of fun. So I'm coming to you from in front of the Prophet stained glass window at the congregation I did my internship at, which is Messiah Lutheran Church in South Williamsport, Pennsylvania. They have a lot of beautiful stained glass throughout the sanctuary, so I figured this would be a good picture to use. Um, as far as the Hanging of the Greens at Christ Community and the Veteran Rap Party, we are going to try to reschedule that as soon as possible so we can make sure we get those gifts to the veterans as soon as possible. We will let you know by email or by phone um, at St. Michael. We are also going to try to reschedule the Hanging of the Greens if it hasn't already been done. I know there were some people there today um, who were working on some of the stuff. So if we need to do that, we will. Regardless, I'm very hopeful to have good test results so that we can, at St. Michael, be there in person for the longest night service tomorrow evening. That's at 7 p.m. Um, and, of course, at both churches for Christmas Eve, 4 p.m. at Christ Community and 7 p.m. at St. Michael. Um, if anything changes and we have to go virtual, I really hope it doesn't. But if any of that happens, then I will let you know. That way you know what's going on. I don't think there's any other announcements. Um, just make sure you're praying for uh, the people in the congregation who have contracted COVID and the people who have been exposed and all the people who are suffering with it because it is a major thing right now. It's all over the place. So please pray for them. Um, hearing no other announcements since I'm by myself, um, I invite you to prepare your hearts and minds for worship as we listen to the prelude.
Before we begin confession and forgiveness, I'll just let you know that if you hear odd thumps throughout the service, it's because I have an upstairs neighbor who does apparently seems to be intent on collapsing the building one footstep at a time. So uh, that's what that noise is. I invite you to join me in confession and forgiveness. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, and from whom no des all desire is known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you, and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son to die for us, and for his sake forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to join me in singing our opening, our gathering hymn, hymn number 251. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all, and also with you. Have mercy on us, Lord, and hear us. 
solemn prayer. We come to hear your living word, it saves us from despair. Have mercy on us, Christ, and wash away our sins. Let us pray. Stir up your power, Lord Christ, and come. With your abundant grace and might, free us from the sin that would obstruct your mercy, that willingly we may bear your redeeming love to all the world. For you live and reign with the Father and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Now we don't have an Advent wreath here, but we are still going to do the blessing of the Advent wreath for the fourth week and sing Light One Candle. So I invite you to join me in this. We praise you, O God, for this wheel of time that marks our days of preparation for Christ's Advent. As we light the candles on this wreath, open our eyes to see your presence in the lowly ones of this earth. Enlighten us with your grace that we may sing of your Advent among us in the Word made flesh. Grant this through Christ our Lord, whose coming is certain, and whose day draws near. Amen. Light one candle to watch for Messiah. Let the light manage darkness. He shall bring salvation to Israel. God fulfills the promise. Light two candles to watch for Messiah. Let the light manage darkness. like a shepherd, gently lead them homeward. Light three candles to watch for Messiah, let the light banish darkness, lift your heads and lift high the gateway for the key. reading from 2 Samuel. Now when the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go and tell my servant David, thus says the Lord. Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in a house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this, late, to this day, but I have been moving about in a tent and a tabernacle. Wherever I have moved about among all the peoples of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I commanded to shepherd my people, Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? 
Now therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be prince over my people Israel, and I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you, and I will make for you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, so that they may live in their own place, and be disturbed no more, and evildoers shall afflict them no more, as formerly, from the time that I appointed judges over my people Israel. And I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. Your house your kingdom, and your kingdom shall be for sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our psalm this morning is from Luke chapter 1. My soul proclaims the greatness of the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God my Savior. For you, Lord, have looked with favor on your lowly servant. From this day all generations will call me blessed. You, the Almighty, have done great things for me, and holy is your name. You have mercy on those who fear you from generation to generation. You have shown strength with your arm and scattered the proud in their conceit, casting down the mighty from their thrones and lifting up the lowly. You have filled the hungry with good things and sent the rich away empty. You have come to the aid of your servant Israel to remember the promise of mercy, the promise made to our forebears, to Abraham and his children forever. A reading from Romans. Now to God, who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the proclamation of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages, but is now disclosed, and through the prophetic writings is made known to all the Gentiles, according to the command of the eternal God, to bring about the obedience of faith, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I invite you to join me in the gospel acclamation. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the first chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one, the Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? The angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. 
And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from, can't see my hands, grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Merciful God, you call upon your servants even in the most unexpected of places and times. When that call comes, help us to be prepared to give ourselves over to your plan. In your holy name we pray. Amen. As I've gotten older, and yes, I am aware that you all think I'm still a baby, but as I've gotten older, I've begun to realize just what a two-edged sword hindsight can be. On the one hand, if you're a well-adapted human being, hindsight helps you learn from your mistakes and allows you to lead a better life. If, on the other hand, you, like me, count obsessing over things as your personal hobby, hindsight can be pretty cruel especially when you lay down to go to sleep at night. Why did I make that decision? Why did I say that then? Why didn't I say that then? Did they understand what I meant or was I too confusing? Did that actually make sense or did it just make sense in my head? It worked in my head, why didn't it work here? The list goes on and on and on. Hindsight might be 2020, but that doesn't stop us from being hard on ourselves. That's, where I go, that's what I go through sometimes when I think about the path that led me into ministry and to where I am now. Now, I don't doubt for a second that everything has worked out exactly as it was supposed to. Too many things fell into the right place at the right time for the Holy Spirit not to have been all over this process. But that doesn't stop me from wondering what it would have been like if I had followed the call earlier and maybe done first call, not in the middle of a contentious presidential election and a pandemic. There were plenty of opportunities. I was just determined not to notice them. I mean, for goodness sake, one of my former pastors sent me to bishop school the summer before 11th grade. The whole point of that week-long program is to help people who are discerning a call to ministry get on the right track before they enter college. But I found my way out of that. I went, but I found my way out of the calling. When I was in boot camp, I served as the division religious petty officer. Even having a chaplain ask me once if I was sure I was following the right career path. But somehow, I still didn't get it. That aha moment didn't finally come for me until around 2009. I was working two jobs, selling auto parts by day at advance, and delivering pizzas by night at Domino's. It had already been a hard night since I'd missed a bunch of good deliveries because I'd been sent on a really long one that I had to go back to three different times. The customers were caretakers at the Yawkey Wildlife Center, which is about 20 minutes south of Georgetown. But what they didn't tell anyone was that they actually lived on the preserve and you had to go over the ferry to get to them because they knew if they told us that, that we wouldn't try to deliver there. So after driving down the road three different times looking for an address that simply did not exist, I finally went across the ferry to deliver their food and got exactly nothing for a tip. By the time I got back to the store, the evening rush had ended and deliveries were slim. So I got really excited when one came in for Deverdu which is a very rich neighborhood between Georgetown and Pauley's Island. But Deverdew was hit or miss. So even though I delivered to a five-story tall house on the beach, I was given a quarter as a tip and told not to spend it all in one place. On the drive back, after I calmed down and saved that address for future reference, I realized I was going nowhere fast especially because I was working in places where I'd never be able to use the talents that God gave me. That night, I told Rosie that I had to make a change. 
Wasn't sure what it was yet, but here we are. For Mary, in our gospel lesson, her aha moment was thankfully less infuriating, but certainly no less life-altering than mine. Here was a girl, and I say girl because marriageable age then was very different from what we would consider okay now. But here was a girl who was as genuinely a nobody as it was possible to be in the grand scheme of the world. I mean, even now, even that she's with her being at the center of the faith, all we really know about her is that she was engaged to a guy named Joseph, and that according to Luke, she was related to Elizabeth, the mother of John the Baptist. Even Joseph's claim to be descended from David isn't all that impressive since David had lived a long time before and had had many, many descendants. We also know that they were living in the bustling city of Nazareth. At the time, the entire town would have consisted of a few houses, possibly a synagogue, and maybe a market. It was like the Ravenel, or cross, of its day. It didn't even have a dollar general. Nazareth was in Galilee, a place that was routinely mocked by those who lived in Judea since they figured that nothing good was going to come from the hinterlands that were surrounded by Greco-Roman territory and Samaria. Even Nathaniel, who became a disciple of Jesus, asked at one point if anything good can come from Nazareth. It was the very last place you'd expect anything amazing to happen. But amazing things were happening, as we hear this morning. While Mary was minding her own business, suddenly Gabriel, one of only two angels who were named in the Bible, appeared in her bedroom and addressed her as favor one. Now here I think we all have to give Mary props for her calm. She surely had no way of knowing that her entire life was about to change, but having an angel unexpectedly show up and start talking to you is enough to make anyone spaz out a little. I mean, at the very least, you'd want to pinch yourself and make sure you weren't dreaming. Who can blame her for being perplexed and wondering what type of greeting this might be? But things were about to get even stranger for her, because Gabriel began to tell her that she was going to give birth to the son of the Most High, a son who would assume the throne of David and not just reign for a while, but reign forever. There was just one small problem. Mary was a virgin and hadn't done anything to get pregnant. So given that little roadblock, Mary rightly asked the angel how this might come to pass. It seemed a little curious. When the angel told her that the Holy Spirit would be involved and that the Most High God would overshadow her, she was simply satisfied. The difference between Mary then and us now is pretty large because we wouldn't have been satisfied with that answer. There's not many of us who would accept the word of an otherworldly being who materialized in our rooms, especially if you were told that you were going to be the mother of God's son. Instead, we'd probably be frantically Googling how-to videos so we could learn how to make tinfoil hats. The type of faith that Mary demonstrated in her conversation with Gabriel is rare in our day and age. It didn't seem to matter to her that she was being told that this son would be part of amazing things. It was almost like the only part she heard was that she was going to conceive a son, and so she asked an honest question. I wonder if she looked back on that moment years later and realized that this was the aha moment that changed her life. Mary's reaction could not have been more different from Zechariah's reaction when Gabriel announced the coming birth of John the Baptist just before this lesson. Zechariah and Elizabeth were old, and Elizabeth had been considered barren for many, many years. And despite the many miracle children God had given the people of Israel in their history, starting with Isaac to Abraham, they had long since given up having children. So when Gabriel showed up to make his announcement, Zechariah didn't just ask a question. He all but demanded proof that what Gabriel said was true. Understandable, sure, but it got him a nine-month stint where he was unable to talk, 
since he didn't believe. He only regained his voice when he followed Gabriel's instructions after John was born and named him John. Clearly, he learned his lesson because the proclamation he gave when he regained his speech has been treasured by the church as the hymn that we sometimes sing at the end of service, Now, Lord, you let your servant go in peace. Unfortunately for us, Zechariah's initial reaction is where we end up too often. We have faith, just as Zechariah and Mary did. We demonstrate our faith by coming to church and doing good works to serve our neighbors, just as Zechariah and Mary did. But when the wheels fall off and everything is going wrong, it can be awful hard to summon up the courage to have the faith of Mary. Instead, we want to plan our way out of the situation. We want to figure it out ourselves. Even when God intervenes to help us, we want to suggest to the creator of the universe that we know better. We want to subject God to a game of 20 questions. And it's only in retrospect that we realize that we're being faced with an aha moment, a moment that changes our lives. Sometimes we get it right, and sometimes we spend many years regretting God's gift of hindsight. If we're to have a model for our faith, it has to be Mary. There's a reason that the church has been so devoted to her for centuries. She represents the one thing that we all find so hard to do. No arguing, no trying to get everything on her terms. All she did was simply say, here I am, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Imagine how much better our lives would be if we could simply be that faithful, faithful Simply be that trusting. Imagine what it would be like if we could simply say that we trust God to bring us through this because our track record for dealing with bad situations, COVID or otherwise, is 100%. Imagine what it would be like to simply hand control over to God, trusting that the one who made each and every one of us knows how to work out things a little bit better than we do. For Mary and for us, the wait for Christ is almost over. We both had a preview of who Jesus would be before he was born. We both now know how life-changing that moment was, how it's completely changed who we are. But unlike the normal way of the world, we don't have to wait for hindsight to show us what we missed when it comes to Jesus. His coming birth into this world has already shown us everything that we need to know. Even better, Jesus' coming birth has already washed away all of the imperfections that we have that kept us separated from God. The only thing we're asked to do is trust. All things considered, that's not too big of a thing to ask in return for our salvation. If a girl from the middle of nowhere Nazareth can show that kind of faith, pretty sure we can too. So, as the last thing for you to do during the season of Advent, the season of preparation, spend this last week practicing how to allow yourself to trust God, to trust that things will work out the way they are supposed to work out, to let the worry go, to let the anxiety go, to let the frustration go, and instead trust that God cares for you and has a plan and has had a plan since the very first day creation was laid out. Thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to join in singing our hymn of the day, the angel Gabriel from heaven came. with me.
brings us drifted snow with eyes as of Oh, hail to thee, O lowly maiden, grant thee, most highly favored lady, Gloria. For no a blessed mother Son shall be Emmanuel by sea is foretold, most highly favored lady, Gloria. The gentle Mary meekly bowed her head to me, be as it pleaseth God. She my soul shall laud and magnify God's holy name, most highly favored lady, Gloria. Of her Emmanuel, the Christ was born, in Bethlehem alone and Christian folk throughout the world will ever say, most highly favored lady, Gloria. That one was a little more difficult than it originally looked. With the whole church, let us confess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. God of power and might, fill your promise, fulfill your promise and come quickly to this weary world. Hear our prayers for everyone in need. Gracious God, all generations call you blessed. In this holy season, we pray for our neighbors of other denominations and faiths. Inspire the faith of their people, cultivate understanding among us, and strengthen us in love and service to our community. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Creator God, you scatter the proud. Everything we have belongs first to you. Bless and protect the seas, mountains, plains, forests, skies, and soils that surround us. Give us humility as we tend them. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Righteous God, you humble the powerful and lift up the lowly. We pray for the leaders of all nations, that they amplify the voice of people in need. Guide all people entrusted with leadership to create societies in which everyone can flourish. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Compassionate God, you fill the hunger with the hungry with good things and send the rich away empty. Nourish those who lack access to adequate food and nutrition. Bless the work of advocates, community organizers, and food pantries. Encourage others to provide for their neighbors in need. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Healing God, you pour out mercy to all who cry out to you. Surround everyone in need of healing in body, mind, or spirit with your tender presence. We remember especially all those on our prayer list and those who we name now, out loud or in the silence of our hearts.
Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Eternal God, you are faithful to the promises you made to our forebears. We give thanks for the ministry of Katharina von Bora Luther and other ancestors who organized, planned, dreamed, encouraged, and reached out as they served you. We give thanks for the bold leadership of female leaders in our own time. Inspire others with their steadfast witness. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Draw near to us, O God, and receive our prayers for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always, and also with you. Let us share that peace with one another however we can through online technology. Send everybody a text and say, Please, peace be with you. And peace be with all of you. Because we're all virtual, obviously, I do want to remind you that you can give offering online from where you are. Um, the link for either church is on those churches' respective websites. Um, and it also comes out in the email that I send out each week, the email you got this link from. Down at the bottom, it says Donate for Christ Community and Donate for St. Michael. Each one of those links will take you to the appropriate donation page. If you don't want to do Tithely, which is the online giving with a debit or credit card, you can always bring your money, your check, your gift by the churches, whichever church you go to, or you can send them in the mail. Just know that the gifts that you give, the stewardship you give, and the time and talent that you provide for the church, these are things that we can't live without. They are the things that help us keep going and keep doing the ministries that we're doing. And we're doing some really incredible ministries in our churches. So thank you for your gifts. And please remember that we're only as strong as you are. Please continue to, to offer your gifts in service for Christ. At this time, we'll go ahead and move on with the offertory. Let us pray. Generous God, you have created all that is and you provide for us in every season. Bless all that we offer, that through these gifts, the word we, the world will receive your blessing. In the name of Jesus, Emmanuel, we pray. Amen. Because we are gathered virtually and because this was an unexpected virtual gathering, we will not be doing communion. There is a way that's kind of endorsed by the ELCA on how to do online communion, but we really didn't have time to prepare anybody for that. So the best way to do this is just to make this a service of the word. So we will continue our service with the words of the Lord's Prayer. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our service continues with our post. It's not post-communion hymn. It's pre-sending hymn. Let us pray. Gracious and abundant God, you have done great things for us, and we rejoice. In this bread and cup, you give us life forever. In your boundless mercy, strengthen us and open our hearts to the world's needs. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. I invite you to join in the singing of our sending hymn, Joy to the World. We definitely need some right now. Go in peace, prepare the way of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
thank you all for being here on this virtual Advent 4 service. And I really look forward to seeing you all in person, hopefully this week. The Lord be with you all.